Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode. I'm really happy you're here. Since we're recording right now at one of my least favorite times of year from a business perspective, it's about tax season. Actually, personal tax season for business was last month. I do remember some of the basics, but personal taxes are due next week, or at least <laughs> for me, my extensions. So I'm really happy today to have Shiloh Johnson here on the show. She's the CEO and founder of Compliant. So before I talk a little bit about your background, thank you so much for coming on the show, Shiloh. I really appreciate it. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. I was going through your background, and I've said this before and best. I love people who have like a background in the subject matter and like have this neat and organized in hindsight. You have this progression of working in taxes for companies and different businesses and kind of moving up. And then all of a sudden you had your own practice and now you have an app. I mean, I could make assumptions on that direction change, but yeah, here this great progression. Why did you decide to build compliant? What was that change from your own practice to the app here? I I'm just naive and crazy enough to believe that my small contributions can affect a lot of lives. And I care more about the legacy of what people remember about me. And what I care to honor that in is how many people did I help? So while one-to-one being a CPA and running a firm is great, you have one client, maybe the max of what your capacity is, is 20, and you're helping these 20 people and it's awesome. But there's probably another 200 small businesses that either can't afford your services or, you know, can't find you or can't find adequate support that equally need that same amount of support and sometimes more than the people that you are supporting. So I I started to meet those people. They were inbound coming to me, coming into my landing page that that I had at the time and were just, I mean, some really crazy issues. Things that you think are like assumed knowledge. But what does that even mean when our education system doesn't support tax Financial, yeah, any financial, <laughs> in any way, or any financial <laughs> knowledge, really. So, and just doing things that were very costly to them. And so, I just was trying to figure out how do I help more of those folks. And the the idea was just so blaringly clear. I was like trying to find places I could send some of these businesses to. Like maybe if you try using this website, it can help you get there. And I couldn't find anything. And I was like this has to exist. There's an app for everything. (laughs) So I just couldn't find it. And I had the light bulb just said, you've got to make it. People need low cost, very simple to understand tax help. And so that's how we got here. Yeah. And I want to really talk about your journey for a bit, but I really like the use case because, you know, so often I could see the like, oh, let's figure out a way to get some basic services. You, the scheduling is such an interesting angle because the business I sold about seven years ago and had run for about nine years previous to that and then past businesses I had run and even the businesses, my own personal yeah, business, exactly. quote, mm-hmm. my personal company I've been doing, missed deadlines. I'm not even talking the big ones. I'm talking like the quarterlies stuff or estimated tax stuff, payments. They've added hundreds, thousands, and in you know some years, even more than, sadly, into the five figures, into sort of just that overall dead cost for lack of just for not being prepared. So I found that such an interesting angle to approach it. Was there any reason why that was sort of the main initial thrust? Yeah, a couple of things. So when I would say things like, in, I'm in California and we have our annual report is $25 every other year. If you don't pay it, it's $250. Yeah. And I would tell people, hey, it's 25 bucks, just do it. Like, go right now, take four seconds. You can fill it out online. And if you don't do it, it's going to cost you 200 And they're like, really? Yes. <laughs> I just kept saying that over and over and over and over. And I was like, oh, there's a massive gap between what people understand to be true about tax and what's actually true. And I just mean deadline wise. It was like, well, the only thing I need to worry about is March or April 15th. No, that's not true. If you sell products, you have sales tax you need to worry about. Business yep. licenses, you in LA, LA business tax, you have that tax to worry about. You also, if you have you know, assets, you have business personal property tax to worry about. You also have your annual reports. If you have physical presence in any other state, you have now tax liability in those states, not just payroll. Yeah. So there was all these things that were just very basic level and basic to me. Let me just clear that up. Uh, (laughs) So that I didn't think that was an issue. And it felt like people just weren't 
connecting the dots and that's okay so first up at that you need the foundation of here are the tax pieces i need to care about instead of worrying myself about this whole big old shift that i just can't even focus on let me just focus on the pieces of this shift that matter to me and right now the pieces of this shift that matter to me is i have a business license in alhambra i have to pay i have you know another business license in inglewood i have to pay because i have an office there and then i have income tax and i have sales tax and if i just focus on those four things now it becomes less overwhelming of like tax as a whole right the biggest anxiety inducer is unpreparedness and how you start to chip away i think at that is just by saying very blanketly here are all the things that need to matter to you let's mm -hmm. start there from there we can build all kinds of tax credits and budgeting and filing, we can build all this stuff extra. But what every other platform was missing was like, you're caring about things that they don't even understand Incompliance. that they're supposed to do. Yeah, we, we need to take like four steps back. <laughs> What's step one <laughs> first? Let's start there. Yeah, I find it really amazing because yeah, I mean, even with having CPAs in the past, you know, it would be sometimes like, uh, uh, you know what, it's only going to be a small fine, but it gets frustrating as the business owner when it's like, yeah, I could sit there and research it and put it all into a calendar and all this. So I was very impressed because it was just like, wow, I've had that pain and I've paid for that pain <laughs> or stupidity <laughs> because that's what it feels like when you yeah. get one of those sort of fines for missing something. In having built this now and you know, as it's growing, where do you see yourself as an entrepreneur these days? Yeah, these days I spend a lot more time on the people management side of things. So when we when I first was thinking about complying, it was me and the product. There was no one else. And so now that I have an entirely built team and I have staff and departments and now we're in the corporate sort of management of organization that needs to happen when you're beyond a handful of people. And so I find my entrepreneurial days these days is like dancing between brand building as far as compliant, the brand becoming a household name, and then also on the other side, people building by managing the folks that work inside the company. I spend a lot of time making sure I build and careful care to build a good work culture. I think we are in what I call work epidemic. <laughs> like it is, the entire environment is drastically, drastically changing. And as the leaders of the sort of corporate movement, if we don't figure out how to work differently, we are going to be on the lost end of that. So I've been trying to be what I call ahead of the game and sort of what work autonomy. So allow people to take ownership over the work, their contributions versus being directed. And so I try to spend a lot of mental time um, thinking through what does that look like in practice and how can we support people building the kind of careers they're proud of while still maintaining some kind of work-life balance and autonomy. So that's my entrepreneurial life these days. Uh, I still have a half a hand in product that I, I sort of gently guide my team to a down this direction so we stay overall on, on the product vision, but that's me these days. <laughs> what was that transition like? I know for some people it was need driven, like, okay, you know, here I am, I'm living the product, I'm living the offering and we're delivering great. But then all of a sudden more people, more movement, someone has to kind of step into that role of coordinating and then, you know, guiding everyone with the vision. Did you sort of plan the transition or was it sort of like, uh, wait a second, <laughs> I think so. I think I need to be talking more. To the yeah, people. not at all. Not at all. I was very just off the cuff. I've raised money. And so when you do that, the expectation that comes along with that fundraise is speed. And so when you're moving quickly and you're trying to get this thing out the door and you're trying to get the numbers up and you're trying to do all these things, the last thing on your mind really is, is company culture. I am forcing it to be the first thing on my mind so that we can retain and, and onboard really great talent. But um, it snuck up on me. And I remember at one point I had a, an advisor come to me and say, you might want to get an executive coach so you understand what levers to pull and when cool. and I was like oh got it okay <laughs> so that that was that change I, I like that because I think a lot of entrepreneurs think about coaches and I've had a couple of very good great coaches yeah. but I've also worked with a lot of toads you yeah. know through the yeah, process yeah. when one of your advisors you know suggested it how did you go about determining a the coach that would work for you? I took referrals. So I went to every person that invested in this company and said, I need a coach. Yeah. Give me your best and brightest. Mm -hmm. And they teed up 
a handful of folks. I did some interviews and, and the ones that resonated closely with where I was ended up working out. I actually have two. I have two coaches and they, they both focus on something very different. Yeah, I have a coach that helps me think through leading as a minority woman. And then I have a coach that helps me think through the practicality of running an organization and the corporate side of, of what is expected of me. And so yeah. it's a nice uh, blend and balance, I think. But I, I try to stay away from cold outreach, cold calling, cold sort of yeah. spray and pray because I don't have a lot of time. <laughs> I love and that I... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to steal that phrase. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> so... I don't have a lot of time. And so I need some of that legwork to have already been done for me. So I'm a, I'm leveraging other people's networks and who other people have worked with and who they vouch by and who they stand by. Like, great, you've done the spraying and praying. Let me lean on that and send me who you've worked with. And then I'll sort of talk through there. I think we don't too, we've lost community a bit as a culture. And in that community environment, what you would get is the offer up of support and services. Hey, I know somebody who does X, Y, Z. You want me to send them your way? We've lost that a bit because we've lost community, I think. So I just try to leverage that as much as I can. Yeah, it's interesting. I think I want to talk about that the concept of community because, yes, I do think, you know, it's the old Yogi Bear thing. You know, no one goes there anymore because it's too crowded. As things have become more digital and the size of interactions, the amount of interactions have moved more digital, more things are possible. But there is that kind of loss of connection, at least this because I do remember the early days dating myself in the early 90s you used to only have like 20 30 people in a whole city who would be talking digital things and like they all knew each other and if you needed something you knew who was kind of one of the few people and then it was like by the yeah you know, mid late 90s that but you talk about an interesting thing I'm going to make an assumption in being able to reach out and ask your investors for advice. There's a couple of things almost that seems stepping back. Your um, the trust you have with your investors to be able to get that information. Is it because of the work you did after they became your investors, or no. was this part of the process of finding the right yeah. investors first? Because that's a hard. Yeah. Having helped people raise money and been an investor in many companies, the vast majority of focus tends to be get the money in and then that piece. But you're articulating a trust in your investors that I don't always hear. So maybe share a little bit about that and what went into that guidance of your investors. Yeah. What I heard a lot early days before I ever raised a dollar from podcasts and, and interviews and videos was like, Make sure you like them because it's a marriage and the divorce is much yep. harder than a real marriage. <laughs> so I knew, you know, coming in the game that I needed to make sure that whoever I was taking money from was going to be people that I could do this with. And so I have had the, the luxury of building in a non-sexy place and being able to have enough movement around building that is garnered me being a little bit choosy. I think a lot of times when people are fundraising, they're either fundraising from a space of we haven't built anything and so we need some people who believe in, in the idea or they're fundraising from a place of like desperation. We are almost out of cash. We'll just take anyone with a pulse who has dollars. We don't even care. I didn't need either one of those things. And so I was coming in and I really was going to bootstrap compliant. It wasn't going to be fundraise. It was going to be all bootstrapped. And people, investors came to me and said, I actually like this, would like to give you money. And then that allowed me to change the power dynamic a little bit. So then I got to evaluate who actually all wants to give me money or who should I be looking for to include in this fundraise process? Because I knew, A, I had such a subject matter expertise. We had already built a very bare bones version of something. And then on top of that, I didn't need and wasn't even planning on including them. So from from that space, <laughs> I, I was able to be a little more choosy. But I think even if you're idea only and you're hoping that someone invests, um, get yourself in your business in a position where you can shift the power dynamic because ultimately your investors are not employees. They're not going to come in and work for you. Even the most aggressive, like we're so hands on, they're lying. They have 50,000 companies there, you know, a million companies they're investing in. You're just one of the many in their portfolio that they need to manage and, and sort of support. And so it's difficult to get people on board that really do what they say, call their bluff. Like, hey, here's what I'm going to need from you. If you're going to join this team as part of being an investor and advisor, I need you to be president in XYZ. What are your top two or three contributions that you bring to your portfolio company? Understand how they view investing and help so that you can decide if this is help that you even want 
or need because at the end of the day, it's a marriage. It's a contractual <laughs> agreement you have with these people that you can't so easily break by saying, I don't like you anymore. So that's how you I know, try to think about it. Being on the opposite side, it is very, you know, having, you know, I'm an LP in a couple of angel funds and I'm an investor in a couple of companies. And it is that I know as an, I want to help the companies I invest in, I really do enjoy. And it's that combination. One, though, if they've spent the time to actually understand what I can do, Two, they are articulating on a regular basis. And third is the sad part, but also how well are they doing? One company that I always had such high hope for, they just repeatedly just like hit themselves with the ball every time. And, you know, it's like, I know they need help, but they have to help themselves first. So I, I agree with you. If you are creating, it's not only that you get more control yeah, in the yeah. relationship it yeah, also yeah. makes it more interesting and more like yeah of course, wow you guys are great yeah what can i do it, yeah, yeah i, I want to help a winner yeah. you know yeah absolutely and i think even not wasting conversations is a thing that we do a lot we'll, we'll just have it to save face um, and, and for every person you meet even if you don't plan on taking their money if investment is your choice it's worth understanding who they are, what, what they do, what, what they consider their strengths. So how can I get to know you? Let's not waste the time. What do you what do you consider your top three strengths? You may not end up taking money from that person, but maybe one of their strengths was we do a lot of work in healthcare. And you just so happen to need to be introduced to some people in healthcare. Hey, I know I didn't take your money, but you said you did a lot of work in healthcare. Can you introduce me to who you who do you know and who can you introduce me to? All of these moments, by not wasting conversations, all of these moments serve to then show up to help you be successful, this, you know, building a product isn't going to happen because of you. It's going to happen because of all the people that are around you that you have been able to galvanize to put in motion. That's really what you're doing as a CEO. You're a connector and a mover. You're not the person, you know, playing the instruments and orchestrating and cleaning. And no, you're doing one very specific job. You are running the orchestra. And if you don't do that, you don't get the opportunity to leverage what other people can do. Because I have heard so many times, how can I help you? And not even from people that I have anything to do with to this day. And if you don't start using some of that, uh, you miss an opportunity to really knock the door down. Well, as you're going through this movement from getting this off the ground, growing it, taking on the investing, and now leading the band, becoming the band leader. And I like that motif. That's a really cool motif. First, who do you see as your customer? And let's talk about like, yeah, what's involving around them. Yeah. The naivete in building something in its infancy is that you don't 100% understand who you're building for. And you have assumptions about who you're building for, which is why the most important advice I ever got early days was customer discovery. If you don't have a product and all you have is an idea, spend every waking moment you can trying to figure out who would want it. And then understand how they think, how they think about buying, how they think about what their problem is, um, how they think about spending money so that you can understand how to position the product. And so I spent a lot of time early days naively thinking every business ever is going to need this because nobody's doing tax right. And we could be the solve for everything. That's not true. What I found is that there are sort of three levels of interest around what we're doing. And the first level is our easiest grab is what we call our new entrepreneur. I'm fresh off, just got my legal Zoom or went to just set up my Atlas and now I have an account. <laughs> I heard from, yep. the, <laughs> from the Instagram girlies, I need an LLC. So the LLC bros told me to get an LLC and FEIN, what do I do next? And so those folks are the easiest because they're prime and they're looking for products to use because now they have this new idea and they are beaming with hope in entrepreneurship and gift and ideation and they're ready to move their thing forward. So those are that's like one level of small business that we support. Uh, we also support a level of business that we call like the mid-tier kind of. <laughs> it's not a <laughs> not a true term, but it's my term. Uh, those folks generally probably do have a CPA, but that CPA does maybe one or two very specific things. They help them with their income tax and they help them pay you know, their estimated payments, but they don't do anything else. So they don't help understand business licenses or sales tax or anything else, and they need the additional guidance. So that's sort of our, our middle tier. And then there's the third tier. That's not a business owner at all in the way you might be thinking it's a service provider, accountants. Because they're like, I want to grow my offering and I want to be able to charge customers more. Can I leverage your tool to do some of that legwork for me? And now I can offer a premium service as a full full tax suite. And so I wasn't even thinking about the middle tier as even being an option. 
I was thinking my first tier was going to be my only option. We were going to be a purely new S&B play. And then all of these other people showed up and said, actually, <laughs> we could use it too. <laughs> and so I think that's worth, that's again, the beauty of customer discovery is because you, you know, can get into a place where you get to understand different dynamics of your potential buyers. That is fascinating because, yeah, I was just thinking of different situations of my own experience. and like, yeah, yeah. I guess you also get a lot of um, confessionals uh, yeah. as a tax person. Because <laughs> yeah. as a marketer, sometimes I get people talking to me about that. But like, I've been using Gusto forever and a day for my payroll. And I still use it just for my personal, for my personal company. At some point, they change from they used to guarantee we'll take care of your state all your state, you know, setups and all that will do it for you. And I moved states and I didn't really recognize it did. And so like, I'm in a new location, you know, da, 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 da. And all of a sudden I start getting these like, you're non-compliance. Here's a lien, yeah, 50 bucks things. fees. Yeah. yeah. But it was just like, wait a second, what happened? I, yeah. I, I did the basic thing, but Gusto does it. And then I'm like, like oh, you don't do that anymore? but you didn't bother telling me you don't do this anymore. <laughs> Whoops. That's on me. That's my stupidity. But yeah, that once again, not a huge problem, but I'd rather $1,000 of fees is still $1,000 not put into the business. And, you know, it's such an annoying problem. And I could see where each of the different angles, my CPA I use has this like cumbersome system from the 90s for document sharing and all this stuff. And it's just like, please, just please get with okay. it. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah, you're learning this experience. Well, okay, now that you're here, how do you see this sort of evolving? Like, where are you looking to kind of grow? And where do you think your skill sets are going to have to evolve around that? Yeah. So product wise, I love to think about us as end to end tax support. And I'm really excited to figure out how we can rethink bookkeeping. I think it's done very poorly and very incorrectly. I'm also very excited to rethink how we can get through simplicity in filing and payment. I think you get a lot more people willing to pay if they only have to press a few buttons. So I'm really excited to streamline <laughs> that process across the board for lots of sort of different tax levels. I think we see municipal revenue and tax revenue increase because they make it a lot easier for businesses to understand where they're missing the mark. I think also COVID did something really interesting to the modern day sort of circle of understanding. When I was younger and like I come up in entrepreneurship, my parents my dad was an entrepreneur. Um, and so I understand it a lot in the sense that I just knew, you know, business license is normal. But because side hustling is becoming the new business owner, there are lots of like missed caveats. And so like the municipality saw during COVID here, we're going to give you all this grant money that was given to us by the state. That we want to give to entrepreneurs. And a lot of people got excluded from that because they were true side hustlers and not true business owners. So I'm looking forward to seeing how we can bridge that knowledge gap and support side hustlers into actually legitimizing their business so they can take advantage of some of the lending opportunities that are available. So I think a lot about that. Also, I think a lot about the kind of entrepreneur and the legacy that I want to leave being in the position I'm in. I'm in rare air as a minority woman, and I have a real opportunity to affect, if nothing else, some minute version of change. And I'm looking forward to kicking down as many of those doors as I can and trying to figure out how I can leverage sort of my brand building and my presence in order to help open up more doors for other minority folks, also to help sort of leverage the knowledge gap that's happening right now. Just overall, there's such a sort of lack of information around a lot of very basic things that are expected of you as an adult person, right, operating in this country that just doesn't exist and tax is a big piece of that. So uh, I'm looking forward to figuring out how I can sneak in legislature and figure out how we could do this a little bit better. But, you know, cool. those are lofty goals. <laughs> no, but that's sort of why we do this. We kind of come at it from the opportunity, yes, to make a living and make a better life. But the reality is we're chasing a concept we think should be dealt with in the world we see. So I really do like that because there's so much. Um, I had a very, very small turn um, after the first big dot-com crash in the early noughts, um, doing microfinances and doing um, East Harlem, doing 
free tax centers, Vita centers, and all that. And it was very interesting because there were people who had relatively not huge amounts of money they were making from side hustles or unincorporated businesses, but would have actually benefited. You know, all of a sudden there's this line where it's like, look, you're making money on the side. You're one the licensing and all those issues become crazy and crazier in this world. Um, but two, it's just the tax advantages of what you can and cannot expense, the variations, the overhead cost of generating those reports, all this versus those trade-offs. And then understanding it's complex and I was spending time on it. And you know, I had a little bit of a background. So it's like someone who is just trying to make a living and doing better that step up to having a company, if you have the right type of business behind it, yeah. once you do, it's such a great advantage to have a company you know, that may be part of the U.S. tax system, good yay or nay for whatever reasons, especially around the S Corp. But it is something that that knowledge, you're right, and it just helps so much and it is not discussed in a constructive way. I think you were referencing um, the LLC. In, yeah, it's like, oh my God, I am, because I have a business profile, I get targeted with, and I'm like, I'm supposed to be looking at this stuff so I can articulate it to the people I help yeah. build their social. And I'm like, can I, is that all? Yeah, like at some point you have to decide that there's only so many people looking for new LLCs, but there's 20 of them. Well, I like that you're looking at this. I, I agree with you. I think those are huge, huge opportunity. And the end-to-end -end things, I mean, it is so cumbersome. I've tried some of the online systems. I have the QuickBooks Online. I have outsourced bookkeepers. I've used Bench. Da, 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 and they all have some nice benefits, but they all kind of do it our way, where you're like, I love that line when you're saying. It's like, look, I will pay more if it's just me doing this. I had Back when, yeah, before I sold my last company, when we were making money, I had an amazing CPA. He charged me an arm and a leg, yeah, every year for the taxes. But I used to still hate that it was like three days a year, we would just be sitting there Doing the signing documents. documents, yeah. you know, going over things, but like yeah. three days of signing documents. It was just like, yeah. this is insane, yeah. you know, for it. It's like, take my money, make exactly. sure it's fair. Whatever yes. it is, and yeah, yeah, we would have discussions on fair, but like, I want to pay taxes. I don't want to pay too much taxes, but I do want to pay taxes. That's, yeah, you have to be careful in how you say that sometimes. <laughs> but like, yeah, I love that, you know, yes, find a way to just, I want to pay to press a button. That yep. would be brilliant. <laughs> For sure. Well, when you look at this, and you're looking at the growth of how you're finding the new audiences, how you're expanding, you have your investors. You have a lot of implicit success factors for the business. The investors are going to push you to grow fast, as you said. You know, you're going to be trying to expand out, fulfill this, you know, the end-to-end -end part of, the, you know, of bookkeeping, you know, of the financial needs of a company. But what are you using to define success for yourself now? Like, how do you, as an entrepreneur, deal with, like, am I doing well or not? How do you look at this thing? And then down the road, how will you look back and say, I was successful or not yeah, as an yeah. entrepreneur, separate from the business? Oh, separate from the business. I think the biggest thing for me is peace. So the way that I leverage how I'm doing well now is do I have peace about the decisions I'm making? Do I have peace about how I'm spending my time? Um, the, the common phrase they ask you is like, what do you, what do you, up, what wakes you up at night or what keeps you up at night? Nothing, nothing. Cause I'm closing these eyes and I don't want to worry about work. I need rest. <laughs> and so, done. <laughs> yeah. And I've ha I have peace about the decisions I've made. I think what keeps people up is the fact that they don't have peace and they're trying to control outcomes that they don't have control over. And what markers success to me currently is, do I have peace about the decisions I'm making? And am I comfortable with how I am presenting myself and my offerings to the world? Whether it's just knowledge, whether it's support, whether it's whatever that is, am I comfortable with the work I'm doing there? If I'm not, there needs to be a shift. It, whether it means I need to do more, whether it needs, means I need to do less. And that's sort of my marker for success these days. 
also in making sure just personally that I am growing my family's portfolio. I don't come from generational wealth. I do come from middle class parents. Let me let me not give you that perception. But I don't come from the kind of wealth where you don't have to worry about money, <laughs> money for generations and generations. And it would be nice to allow my children and their children to think through how can we have a life that we are proud of that isn't contingent on slaving over a dollar. And so I would love to raise my children are older now, but more generations of whether it's nieces and nephews and cousins and their children that feel supported to believe in something bigger than them and then be able to chase that thing versus having to always think about how am I going to eat. So I, I spend a lot of time thinking through how can I make sure that um, I'm doing that work and then how that will look in the future is probably more of that. I, I care a lot about education. Both my parents are educators. My grandmother was an educator. My aunt is an educator. My brother and sister, they're both educators. So while I will never be a teacher <laughs> or a professor <laughs> in any degree, <laughs> I do want to educate people, however that looks, whether it's writing books or you know informational situations such as this, like podcasting or whatever that means to get as much of my experience of the world out, I think is extremely valuable to whomever has those experiences. We are in the most like diverse dynamic now where you can get mediums of information anywhere, right? So at one point it was like, what was it? Books? <laughs> you had like books and the radio. <laughs> so we are now at a place where there are so many tiers of that. I know my children, they're in their early twenties, late teens, and their number one educational resource is TikTok. <laughs> they don't Google, they don't do, they literally look it up on TikTok and that's how they get their education. And admittedly, they will tell you, if I didn't see it on TikTok, it didn't happen. And while that is terribly scary, it is also, <laughs> you know, evidence of how nimble sort of this information consumption process is. And I feel very deeply that we, tax is not ever going to go away, not in my lifetime or maybe theirs or theirs or theirs. So as much as we want to revolt against the system, that tax powers the system. And so that revenue powers the system. And I, I just don't, not having sort of that traditional education on these new mediums is hindering the younger generation from being able to participate because they're, ex they're being excluded from sort of opportunities to do what we're required to do, but maybe just a little bit different. And so... I think there's a lot of that work will be what, what I garner as success in the future is how can I support as many people as possible in this sort of knowledge gap? So, I mean, <laughs> very impressive. Talking about your ability to sleep soundly as a an entrepreneur who I can usually tell where I am in my own business cycles by tracking the amount of sleep I get. That is probably one of the more deliberate and how to say you do a lot of deep work without saying you do a lot of deep work because the two general ways you can sleep soundly is to be a complete fool and not care or care so much that you have taken care of all the issues and been proactive in developing the environment instead of being reactive. What do you think helps you the most in being able to be proactive here in developing entrepreneurial environment here? Because it sounds like you very much are keeping a structured control on the environment, both from what you talked about, the investors, what you're now talking about, the growth, how the control you had going into even needing the investors to then the growth of the different audiences here to them, just the way you just sort of said, yeah, it's my ability to know that I'm comfortable. And yeah, it's like, that wasn't the phrase I'm, mi I'm missing, it. but it's yeah. still like, it's that idea of like, simple is hard. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like keeping things simple, keeping things on, that's harder than yeah. sort of, blah, 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 blah. so yeah, please how? I think by default, one of my personal gifts, and we all have them, is introspection. The way that I tune into me is to like dynamic levels. And I do this because, A, I spend a lot of time alone. I actually prefer being alone. I, I am the least alone because I always have someone around, but I, I love that moment for me because I can't control anything else. I can't control the environment. I can't control the government. I can't control tax. I can't control my employees' decisions. I would like to, but I cannot. I cannot control anything. The only thing I really, truly have control over is me. 
And if I don't take the reins and understand me so well, it's going to be really difficult to turn on the best of me when I need to and turn off the not so best of me when I need to. We have watched this happen in like the CEO landscape over and over and over and over and over again. It's sort of this celebration of excellence or, you know, brilliance or genius without ego. any with uh, inflated ego, without any checks and balances on, has this person checked in on that? We're watching it happen with Elon Musk. What we watch it happen every single day with so many figures that are sort of inflated in this idea of my thing, my information, my money, my gift is the best thing that I'm putting. Yeah, me, 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 without tap, tapping in and saying, hold on, what's happening here? We're watching it happen globally with the breakdown of mental and emotional health literally has been in shambles collectively at, in the human culture. This isn't even an American problem. This is a, a world problem that people just have lost them. And there's no better sort of lever you can pull than the one that is within you. It's the reason strokes, heart attacks, high blood pressure. I mean, there's so many levers that are affecting your ability to be tapped in with you. And my sole job as CEO, and this is another thing I think people are missing, is like, people don't know what their job is. They think it's this and it's really this. My sole job as CEO is to make decisions. And my ability to make clear, thoughtful, well thought out decisions the best I can do to do that is to take care of me and know me so well. I know that when I reach my arm out, it's gonna hurt to let me not reach my arm out. What we're doing, I don't know, I think it hurts, who knows? And then we just keep reaching our arm out. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, get used to it, right? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's, this is just life. To be? Yeah, this is life, who knows? It's this, this, right? Isn't it supposed right. to be on fire everywhere? Right, this everywhere, feels right. not yeah. necessarily, not within you, right? Within, yes, there's fires all around me all the time. My team, I, it's probably a fire I gotta put out right now as soon as we hang up. There's always gonna be sort of the juggle, but the thing I can do to, to sustain me and to make it so that I can sleep, so that my health is good, my hair is not falling out, I'm not having to be manic depressive and I'm not having to take pills and all these extra things. In order for me to show up the best version of me, that is the greatest gift I can give this company and everybody that works on it and also everyone that has invested in it. Me showing up a fraction of who I am does nothing for anybody, except people are going to quit because I've created a toxic work environment. Um, my investors now don't have faith in my ability to do this at a massive scale because I'm not taking care of myself. Like You're the reason they've invested. You built this thing and you built it when you were much less stressed out. You're going to be much more stressed out the more your business grows. So your job is to figure out how to manage the stress so that you can be present in good decisions. This is how this is how crazy stuff happens because we've nurtured an environment for crazy. No, it is very true. I mean, not to go off, but I know even small levels of success sometimes it is so easy, both my own journey and then other entrepreneurs I've seen invested and just known the any type of success, you don't get celebrated reality, but you can get attention. And that attention, you know, you feel is going to help the business. But the reality is it does this little teeny bit of like, okay, you've done well, so then maybe you do know what you're talking about type of thing. But the reality of what it does is it really feeds the ego out of proportion to the value of what you're generating. And I think that is a really hard thing. I mean, you're a very impressive entrepreneur, and I think... I can't wait to see more. And I think your investors are incredibly lucky on um, getting to ride on your journey here. I just like how compatible this is with different types of tax approaches. If you're doing it yourself, if you have a CPA and this, what's the best way, one, that they can learn more about compliant, but then also they can learn more about you and what you're doing? Yeah. yeah. So our website, that's compliant with a Y, uh, compliant.co. And we have a resource hub there that is just, it's my heart for the entrepreneurial community. It's videos, it's blogs, it's one sheets, it's booklets about just understanding the very basics of starting a business and running a business on the finance side and well, at least the tax and accounting side. And so um, that's a great place to start. You can learn about what we do, what, how we can help you. Our LinkedIn presence is pretty good for understanding what we do. I am very rarely am on LinkedIn and more of a uh, resume showy version. But if you want to yeah. get to know me, I I'm not super social media heavy just because I'm 
really intentional about my time and the yep. internet is not where I want to spend nope. it. But if you want to find me in any degree, I am on Twitter and it's just my first and last name, Shiloh Johnson. I'm actually right. everywhere at that same moniker, so I can keep it simple. But um, I'm not a poster. So if you're going to come there and you're looking for <laughs> your daily inspiration, you're probably not going to get it from me. Uh, I'm more of an output driven kind of person. But yeah, well, that's us. Tell you what, we will put all that into the show notes. Make sure that when the email comes out announcing this episode, it will be there too. And of course, in our socials. And I like that your focus is on the business and the value you're bringing and not into, you know, hey, check me out. So everyone, really go check out Compliant. I think there's many really cool, interesting value cases for different types of business, to, you know, especially since 82% of our audience is American. The rest of you don't don't worry, but definitely <laughs> check it out. And just that little bit of extra compliant, you know, understanding of what's what's coming, what do you need to take care of, and all that can relax a little bit of your journey. Sure. So thank you so much for coming on the show, Sarah. It was really great to have you on today. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. This was great. Oh God. We're going to have to bring you back down the road. If I can get you back down, I would love to have you when you're sure. further on this journey because I really, I want to see where you're going next on this, but I like what I'm seeing so far. This is very cool. Thank you. Hey everyone. Thank you again for listening to the show. And if you enjoyed today's show, if you know anyone who could actually learn from this, please share it with them. Tell them to go subscribe. The more subscribers we get, the more cool entrepreneurs we can like Shiloh we can bring on the show. I really appreciate it. All right, everyone. Have a great day, and I'll talk with you soon.